How do you write a sophisticated rhetorical analysis? In this video, I'm going to give you my advice on doing exactly that. Uh, remember, the key here is reading the rhetorical context or situation. So I'm going to turn off my webcam and we're going to uh, get this party started. So remember, AP English Language is a university composition course, and, and all universities require analytical reading and writing in virtually all courses. Rhetorical analysis means reading the situation, the moment. Uh, the rhetorical analysis essay, according to the course and exam description, requires you to read a nonfiction text. You've probably seen this language before, and then analyze how the writer or speaker's language choices contribute to the intended meaning and purpose of the text. This is what a typical prompt looks like. It has four components. We open with background on the occasion, and then we have uh, the directions, the actual task, read the passage carefully, and then write the essay. Uh, then we have these five bullets. This is the only essay that has five. The other two only offer four bullets. This one has this little guy right here, demonstrate an understanding of the rhetorical situation. You won't see that on the synthesis or the argument. Pro tip. This is the most important bullet. Then you're going to get the text itself, which is generally right around 500 words, give or take. Well, today we're going to look at the 2019 uh, Gandhi letter to Lord Irwin prompt. Uh, remember, the task here is to read the situation. That's what rhetorical analysis means. So the, that direction, read the passage carefully, this is the stable prompt language, and then write an essay that analyzes the rhetorical choices the speaker makes to do whatever it is that speaker is trying to do. So your job, you've seen the rhetorical triangle before, you should understand rhetorical context, read the situation. You've seen the sophistication language in the rubric too, there it is right there. Uh, this is the one essay that really gives you an opportunity to develop a complex understanding of the rhetorical situation. This is the key. I'm gonna say this again later on, Context over text. Read the context, not just the text. That's the key. We know that the College Board gives us 40 minutes to write each essay plus 15 extra minutes to read and annotate. We also know that careful reading and annotation are critical. Many students rush the reading on the synthesis and the rhetorical analysis because they're worried that they only have 40 minutes to write. And that leads to a rushed essay no matter how long you take. The key is reading carefully. So we're going to recommend that you actually take twice that time for your reading and annotation. Uh, and if you can write each of your essays in just 35 minutes, that buys you 30 minutes to read and annotate, which makes a lot more sense because it'll help you know where you're going when you start drafting. So I recommend you take 15 for the synthesis alone and then 10 more for the rhetorical analysis. There we go. Uh, don't rush the reading. That 10 extra minutes for the rhetorical analysis will allow you to read, again, not just the text, but the context. So you're gonna read for the situation. So let's talk about how to do that. Um, this is what many students will do, by the way, uh, when they rush the reading, they jump right into the text and they, uh, they operate under the assumption that their job is to identify some rhetorical decisions or some rhetorical strategies or devices and then string them into a thesis. So you, I, I'm, I think you've seen this Gandhi prompt before. Feel free to pause and go ahead and read the text if you like. We're going to move pretty quickly. If I'm reading through this Gandhi text, hunting for rhetorical choices so that I can create a thesis, a three-part thesis statement, I might just go, okay, let's see here. I see some strong diction here, gravest, evils, evil again, cruel monopoly. Cool. I found some strong diction. All right, and then I have this little piece here. My ambition is no less than to convert the British people through nonviolence and make them see the wrong they have done to India. That's an ethical appeal. I've got ethos here, two down, one to go, right? Here we go down here. I find this uh, language here. If we want to sever the British connection, it is because of such evils. When they are removed, the path becomes easy. This is a nice logical narrative here. So I'm done. I've found my, uh, my strong diction, my ethos, and my logos, and I'm going to string them into a three-part thesis statement, and I'm on my way. Gandhi establishes credibility and uses logic. I'm, I'm not even going to call them pathos and ethos. Uh, I'm just, or uh, sorry, uh, ethos and logos. Um, I'm going to use English. Establishes credibility and uses logic and strong diction to present his case to Lord Irwin. That, my friends, is unsophisticated. It is what we call predatory reading or a treasure hunt for rhetorical devices, rhetorical strategies, and that is not 
demonstrating or developing a complex understanding of the rhetorical situation. Let's talk about how to do that. The key is at the top, carefully reading the context. All right. What is the speaker's most interesting challenge or opportunity here? That's the question I want to ask. That, my friends, is exigence. We know exigence is the, the thing that excites or upsets uh, an author and leads them to invent an argument. So that's exigence. So another way to think about that is the most interesting challenge or opportunity, and that will lead to uh, a complex understanding of the rhetorical situation. That's what I'm going to look for. So let's look at the introductory context to this prompt. Uh, and again, I'm looking for that challenge or opportunity. Uh, let's see, 1930, Gandhi led a nonviolent march in India protesting Britain's colonial monopoly. So this was a protest, okay, fair enough, on the taxation of an essential resource salt. And let's see, this was a triggering moment for the larger civil disobedience movement that eventually won India independence from Britain. So it was a successful protest. It eventually worked. Um, and that happened in 1947. Let's see, shortly before that. Okay, so even before the march that triggered the larger movement was this letter. So this could be the match that, that sparked the entire thing. So this is, okay, that's important to note too, that this happened even before the SALT march. What else do we have here? Gandhi wrote to Viceroy, Viceroy Lord Irwin, the representative of the British Crown in India. So this, is, this guy's holding all the cards. Now we've got um, the subservient Gandhi writing a letter to the person with all the power. My job, before I even read the text, is to try to come up with a take on that interesting challenge or opportunity. It seems to me that Gandhi's got to find a way to get Lord Irwin to read this letter at all. How is Gandhi going to get the British crown to take him seriously? That is a challenge. I like that. That's the kind of thing I'm going to use to guide my rhetorical reading. Now I can look for rhetorical choices that help Gandhi get Irwin to take him seriously. All right, so let's look at the the actual task. Write an essay that analyzes the rhetorical choices Gandhi makes to present his case. I'm going to rephrase this again. What was the most interesting challenge or opportunity? And then how did he meet this challenge or take advantage of the opportunity? Let's start there. Uh, the most interesting challenge. And then the language for thesis is important to note here too. Um, respond to the prompt with a thesis does not say statement. So I don't have to analyze the writer's rhetorical choices in one sentence. Thesis means position. The whole essay is a thesis. I don't have to actually create a three-part thesis. I don't have to mention rhetorical choices in the thesis. I have to speak to rhetoric. So I'm going to stick with this question. What was his most interesting challenge? Let's see here. It's seen, now, of course, I've read the whole passage by now, so I can offer my uh, introductory context my summary judgment of the text as a whole. The letter was a warning that India intended to flip the power balance between their nation and its main oppressor. Pretty bold thing to do when you're when you're talking to the guy holding all the cards, right? So that's my introductory context. Here's my central claim. Getting Irwin to take him seriously required directness and tact. Okay. Um, you, by the way, will not find directness and tact in the glossary of rhetorical strategies in the back of your textbook. These are simple decisions or choices that I see Gandhi making in order to get Irwin to take him seriously, directness and tact. I'm on my way. Now, how did he do it? So there's my, there's my introduction, right? And my central claim, getting Irwin to take him seriously required directness and tact. As I read the text now and annotate uh, specifically for the things that helped him get Irwin to take him seriously, these are the things I see. He chose to maintain a respectful tone. Now, there's your first uh, textbook term, tone. And it's not one that's difficult to remember. We all understand tone, right? Gandhi chose to maintain a respectful tone. Um, he clearly explained his nation's intent. When you're speaking to somebody in power, you've got to be direct. They're not, they're not going to take you seriously, one, if you're disrespectful. But also, you can't beat around the bush. You've got to go straight to the point. So he clearly explained his nation's intent. And then... He justified potential action. That's another way to talk about a logical or even an ethical argument. He justified whatever action was coming. Simple English. Uh, and then what do I conclude after analyzing the rhetorical situation? I want to offer an original conclusion. It's tempting sometimes to just summarize everything I've already said, but my reader doesn't want to read a summary of what I just wrote. They just read what I just wrote. So I want to offer a summary judgment of the moment. Again, I'm focusing on the context, right? 
and I don't know a whole lot historically about, about Lord Irwin, to be honest with you, but I do know a little bit just from that opening context in the prompt. And it seems to me that since the Salt March worked, I don't know whether Irwin actually took Gandhi seriously or not, but he probably should have. Uh, because the Salt March worked, and I wouldn't want to be Lord Irwin going back to the British crown after this is all over and saying, you know, I kind of knew this was coming, but I didn't think it was important to tell you. That would probably get him in trouble, right? That's a simple inference I can make from reading the situation. So here's how I'm going to conclude. Irwin would have been wise to take Gandhi's letter back to his superiors. History tells us the Salt March worked. This letter was a preview of things to come. So now let's, let's outline this entire analysis and watch how the line of reasoning falls into place. Gandhi's letter was a warning that India intended to flip the power balance uh, with its main oppressor. Getting Irwin to take him seriously required directness and tact. He chose to maintain a respectful tone. I can now provide examples from the text of lines in which I see this respectful tone. There's a third one. Uh, he clearly explained his nation's intent. Here are a couple of places where I see him doing that. Uh, and he fully justified potential action. A couple more quotes. Of course, these can be paraphrases. They don't have to be quotes. But there, in this case, I found no fewer than seven that actually fit into my line of reasoning very nicely. And then I can conclude with this idea that that uh, Irwin probably should have taken him seriously because we know the salt march worked. And suddenly I've got this nice line of reasoning. And look what this does. It develops a complex understanding of the rhetorical situation in very simple terms. I stayed at the bird's eye view and looked at the, the situation, not, not just the rhetorical choices within the text. That's the key to earning sophistication. Again, the key is to remember this, context over text. Uh, I hope you found that helpful. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.